Welcome to Worlds Apart. The international community's approach to marine conservation has undergone a sea change in recent years with the expansion of protected areas. But is it enough to stop the destruction of the world's oceans? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Enrique Salah, a marine ecologist and National Geographic explorer in residence. Mr. Salah, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Now, you often... Uh, compare the world's oceans to a bank account. Everybody keeps withdrawing, nobody or very few people want to make a deposit. Is that because the interest rates are seen as too low or perhaps because um, you know, it, it takes just too much time to wait for the returns? The ocean can come back really quickly. The interest rate can be really high. The problem is that the way we manage that bank account, that, that natural capital, is not very smart because we are taking fish out of the ocean faster th than they can reproduce. So we are uh, eating away from the principle. But I think one of the reasons why governments are so slow on picking up uh, your suggestions is the economic factor because the global fishing industry is worth, if I'm not mistaken, around 500 billion dollars and uh, reducing the fisheries would translate into substantial loss in the in the very short term you make a case that they can always compensate for that and that there are better economic uh, opportunities there but that is a, a delayed gratification argument that you know you, you still have to you have to lose now in order to get more in the future and i think delayed gratification is a really hard sell at a time of economic recession do you think we will have to wait until the global economy is back on track to you know realize what you're proposing it's not me who is proposing that, it's the World Bank, it's world-class uh, economists. The World Bank published a report a few years ago showing that because of the mismanagement of fisheries and because of all the illegal fishing and the subsidies, the world is losing $50 billion every year. If half of the fishing fleet was cut right now, the other remaining would be catching the same amount of fish with more value for the fish, would reduce the costs and increase the profits. The problem is that you know, we have been uh, exploiting that principle of the ocean in a way that is not sustainable. So delaying it more, it will only perpetuate the collapse of fishes. Mm -hmm. Now, one way that um, you and I assume World Bank suggests we can make uh, a deposit into our common future is to increase the, the, the area that is protected by marine reserves. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, right now it stands at about 2%, uh, which is a substantial increase over the last couple of years, but it still uh, falls short of your goal. Do you, do you think you will, um, you are on target of hitting that 20% uh, goal by 2020? Well, scientific studies suggest that between 20 and 50% of the ocean should be protected to give enough uh, provision of goods and services to the world, but Russia and the international community committed at the United Nations to protect 10% of the ocean by 2020. And we are only at 2%. We have three years left and we have to multiply the area that is protected times five. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one important metric of uh, the ocean's well-being is biomass. And there was um, an interesting report recently that found that by 2050, the, uh, there would be more plastic in the oceans than there are fish. Uh, even if you manage to achieve that uh, very ambitious goal uh, and create those protected zones, how will you protect them from pollution and the garbage, all the garbage that is floating around? Because obviously there are no physical borders in, in the ocean. Yeah, there are three main impacts affecting the ocean. One is overfishing, too much fishing. We've taken fish out of the ocean too fast. Two is pollution. Every year, 8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean. And by 2020, we expect the same weight of plastic as fish in the sea. And the third one is climate change, which is making the ocean warmer and more acidic. So there are many problems and there are many solutions. So there is no silver bullet. It's more like a silver uh, buckshot. So marine protected areas is one of the tools in the toolbox. We also need to 
prevent plastic from getting into the ocean, right? So there are many, many different solutions, and reserves cannot protect from everything, but they are very important to at least allow marine life to recover. Now, one proof that the reserves uh, cannot protect from uh, everything is, uh, I think, Great Barrier Reef. You often mention it in, in your talks. It, it enjoys the highest level of protection. It, it is protected by UNESCO, but it is being degraded by water pollution. It is being degraded by shipping traffic, and on the top of that, the Australian government is now considering a plan of building the, the world's largest uh, mining port there. Doesn't that, uh, again, prove the point that uh, reserve status in and of itself doesn't guarantee absolutely anything? You can still have the status, but uh, the negative consequences will be uh, continuing. What this proves is that we need to tackle pollution, we need to tackle agricultural runoff, and we need to tackle climate change. Because this is affecting not just the ocean, it's affecting everything on the planet, right? The good news is that when marine reserves are well managed, the fish come back spectacularly. In less than 10 years, the abundance of fish increases by five to 10 times all around the world. And that also helps increase the income of fishermen who are now catching more fish around these areas. But it's not just about, I mean, I think fishing is an important factor, especially in poorer areas, in poorer countries, in poorer neighborhoods. But uh, if, again, we stick with the, uh, with the issue of Great Barrier Reef, what's interesting about it is I think that it both supports and undermines your sort of business model argument because on the one hand the uh, the government of Queensland is getting a lot of money from tourism I think 40 times more than from fishing but on the other hand it doesn't stop them from considering other economic opportunities that they uh, will bring in even more money so isn't there a danger in making a business case for protecting the environment because you can always you know make a better business case for making more money I, I don't think uh, this is the right approach because if we have a problem is because there is this polarization between it's either the environment or the economy. And I think that we have proven people who think like this wrong because the economy is based on nature. Nature provides goods and services. It gives us, the ocean gives us more than half of the oxygen we breathe. You know, we don't have an economy on the moon. Why is that? Because there is no nature, right? So. Uh, there, is mo there are more and more economists, including Nobel Prizes in economy, who understand that the economy is a subset of our planet, is not the central core of everything where nature is an externality. So what uh, Australia needs to do and other countries need to do is smarter planning and, and integrate all of the human activities to make sure that mining on, on the mainland does not affect coral reefs uh, on downstream. So it, it's the lack of, of integrated planning that countries uh, do that is the problem. Well, I think one good example of that um, comprehensive planning would be uh, the country of Gabon. Uh, you, you often talk about um, the fact that they managed to create this uh, uh, very strong uh, marine protected area uh, in one of the strongest in Africa. But what interests me is that uh, we also have countries like Japan, Norway, and Iceland, which are far better off economically, which are considered to be environmentally conscientious, and yet uh, they cannot be persuaded to stop their whaling shows, for example. So uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, a matter of awareness. It doesn't seem to be a matter of money, because those countries have money. So what, what's the problem then? Yeah, the problem with uh, the whaling in Iceland and Japan is the heavy political influence of a very small special interest sector, right? Gabon is a great success story, however. Gabon is in West Africa. It was a country with great corruption in the fisheries department. But when President Bongo learned about what was going on, he fired the entire fisheries department and brought new people in. But that, that's exactly my point, that in a relatively poor African country with a high level of corruption, you, you can make spectacular success, but at the same time in established democracies with strong economies, that success isn't forthcoming. How do you explain that? Well, the world is not an easy or perfect place, and I think that what we need to do, instead of trying to fix the systemic issues of the world, which will take a long time, is to identify what are the bright spots, what are the success stories, and how can we replicate them elsewhere? Well, okay, let me bring up uh, one success story. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, you've been... Um uh, you've been fairly successful in your cooperation with the British government, which has committed itself to the creation of two protected uh, zones, one uh, in the Pacific, another one in South Atlantic. And um, 
I would argue that it, it is one of the very few examples of um, how colonialism could be positive. Uh, you know, that gives a former colonial power an opportunity to invest in its, uh, in its former colonies. Do you think other former colonizers will follow suit? Spain, France, uh, perhaps Portugal? Yeah, I think, you know, I like to see the environment as an issue that is not po a political issue, right? But it is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it is. That, that, that's, that's the thing, that um, uh, environmental decisions are made in many cases based on, on political, geopolitical uh, issues, right? But at the end of the day, the environment is something that affects us all. It doesn't matter if you're right wing, left wing, center, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You know? uh, the decisions that should be made on, on the basis of the, of, the global, of the global good. That's why I think that you know, if we want to make sure that uh, the ocean and nature continues providing for us all these services that are so critical to our survival, you know, we need to put aside uh, political and geopolitical but considerations. But I think geopolitics can also provide very persuasive arguments. Uh, Great Britain, for example, used to be the, the main nation controlling the sea. So that's another way of how you can actually compensate for some of the damage that was done in the past. Because yes. obviously, I mean, you say it doesn't matter whether the, the countries are rich or poor, but it does matter because uh, marine protection is an expensive uh, enterprise. You know, do need to create those zones, but you also need to enforce that, uh, that protection. So it takes a lot of resources. Yeah, but, you know, Protection is not a sacrifice. We have proven that protection is a great opportunity and actually delivers even, even economic profits. So there is, there is this uh, belief that, oh, I cannot create this protected area because how much is it going to cost me? But protected areas, we have hundreds of examples around the world, are good businesses. You know, when you protect an area, the fish come back and then the divers come in. Mm -hmm. Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. 56,000 jobs are supported by the Great Barrier Reef, which brings 5 billion Australian dollars to the local economy. This is uh, 10 times more than the cost of managing the area. So the area pays for itself. Well, I hope uh, the Australians uh, keep that statistic in mind as they proceed with their plans for uh, port construction. Uh, Mr. Slaw, we have to take a very short break now. When we come back, the environment has been a victim of geopolitics in recent decades, but can it also bridge the differences between political actors? That's coming up in a moment on Worlds Apart. Stay tuned. Uncovering hidden stories, moving against the mainstream, going to all lengths to bring real news to Britain. I'm Afshin Ritansi, going underground to bring you the stories that really matter, only on RT. The low oil prices has affected everybody from the global economy to oil producers around the world to U.S. shale oil production even the rich members of OPEC like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait uh, all these countries Around four o'clock, Ovini, in Gomborungala. Near Meruguri, Borno State. There are 15 people, 15 young boys like him. But the Boko Haram come attack the house. Take one gallon of the petrol. That's why he get this wound, because fire burned him very well inside the room. But the guy found a way to refugee camp, Dar es Salaam, Bagasola, chat.
Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing the politics of marine conservation with Enrique Salah, a marine ecologist and National Geographic explorer in residence. Uh, Mr. Salah, before the break, we talked about the depletion of the world's fish stocks, and there was recently a study that found that the annual global fish catch has been underestimated for many, many years, whereas the annual decline in uh, fish catches uh, is four times greater than uh, we previously thought. That, so it looks like the situation is far more serious than uh, many government officials perhaps think of it. In your conversations, and I know that you tried to meet with many governments around the world, do you think their perception of the problem is accurate? The perception of the problem for many governments is not accurate because the fisheries department in many countries around the world tend to over uh, report what they catch and also there is a lot of illegal fishing the experts who have published this study estimate that between a quarter and a third of all the catch in the world is caught illegally and is not reported but then again that raises a question of enforcement enforcing those protected zones because uh, Apparently, it's not uh, enough to just establish them. You, you need the fleet that will uh, make sure that uh, those protect protected zones are indeed respected. No, but absolutely. That, that, that's a lot of investment again. Absolutely. The success of protected areas is good enforcement. Fortunately, today, we have commercially available satellite technology that makes enforcement so much cheaper than the traditional methods of having boats uh, in the sea and, and people in the sea. So now at National Geographic, our pristine seas project, we are working with uh, satellite companies, with Oceana uh, Conservation Organization, Google, and Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation mm -hmm. on a global uh, satellite system to make remote surveillance very effective and, and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. I know that fishing is also a critical protein and food source for uh, around 2.5 billion people around the globe, especially in the Indian Ocean Rim, where a lot of countries suffer from poverty. And that raises a spectrum uh, of uh, potential social instability. That could generate substantial refugee flows if uh, people are uh, finding it difficult to provide for their, for their families. I wonder if... Uh, Perhaps uh, a better way of attracting attention to this issue would be to reframe it not as an environmental one, but as a security one. Because at least in Europe, I know people are now very serious about refugee flows. So if, if you could uh, suggest that there, there could be potentially another one, let's say, coming from the uh, you know, southeast, perhaps they would invest more, at least pay more attention to it. Definitely, there are already environmental refugees. And in the future, we expect to have more environmental refugees, and they are not going to come from fishing. They are going to come from the effects of climate change, which is going well, to be the overall. I mean, it's a synergetic effect, both uh, from both factors. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's the the water wars. Uh, I believe are going to have uh, the biggest impact on on environmental refugees in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the refugee uh, problem, and I think what it shows is that people start paying attention, serious attention, to anything when it affects them directly. You, you've been very um, emotional, very passionate about describing your experiences of diving, but I think many of us, people who live in big cities, uh, don't really understand what you're talking about because we have never witnessed neither either the beauty of the ocean or the depletion of it. Um, don't you think that humans as a species are essentially losing their ability to enjoy nature? I think we are getting more disconnected from nature yeah. and technology is helping us in so many ways but in some other ways it is disconnecting us from nature. Many kids in big cities have never seen a cow and when they ask to draw a tuna they draw a circle because this is what they see. You know, tuna is this thing that comes on a, on a circular can. So this is a problem. However, what we have seen is that every time we take somebody in nature being on a pristine site or, or a forest near a city, it can be a kid or a mother or a president. When somebody goes into nature, they are completely transformed and the little kid in them uh, shows up, right? So there is this uh, deep connection that is called uh, biophilia, you know, there is this deep link between humans and uh, unspoiled nature. So the, the link is there, but our society is uh, distracting people and, and breaking that link. 
Well, I guess one of such uh, places would be the Antarctic, and uh, there is now um, a concerted effort to designate the, the Ross Sea as a protected zone, and those efforts have so far haven't been uh, very successful because of the lack of consensus, or more precisely because of Russia's refusal to join in. And I think the, the standoff between Russia and the West certainly doesn't help. How do you see the way out? Will we have to wait for those uh, geopolitical tensions to subside, or perhaps it's the other way around? Can it serve as a catalyst, uh, you know, doing something together? Can it serve as a catalyst for improving those relations? I, th I think so. You know, the Antarctic Treaty in 1959 uh, developed a space for uh, nature, science, peace, and international cooperation, right? Antarctica is a place where no decision is made without consensus by a bunch of countries. The Ross Sea is the most amazing place, the largest wilderness left in the ocean. It's like the Serengeti of Antarctica with huge populations of killer whales and leopard seals and emperor penguins. It's an extraordinary place. And it's a place that is the jewel of, of the, the polar world. Uh, Russia has uh, rejected the proposal by 24 other countries for four years in a row because the Russian delegation had technical and legal questions. But now these questions have been answered satisfactorily by the, the experts from all around the world. And right now I don't think it's a technical or a scientific decision. Right now it's a political decision. And I hope that Russia, which has a tremendous history in Antarctica. Russia discovered Antarctica, conducted some of the best uh, research. It has the largest number of research stations. I hope, and the world hopes, that Russia will assume that uh, responsibility as a global player and will take leadership and it will lead this international group of nations to protect something that will make Russia uh, the global conservation leader for many generations well, to come. I, I, thank you for paying so many uh, compliments to Russia's uh, conservation record, but I, I think part of Russia's uh, opposition could be explained by the vast oil reserves there and Russia's fears that other nations, particularly Western nations, could use the legal loopholes in the proposed Ross Sea Agreement to their advantage. You mentioned that the uh, technical issues have now been cleared up. Do you think other parties to that proposed agreement are ready to uh, put those technicalities on paper and make them binding. You know, the proposal that the international community put together, these 24 countries, says it very clear. This place would be a reserve for science and no commercial exploitation by any country will be done. And, you know, why is the Rod Sea not protected yet? Because Russia hasn't agreed to. So it takes absolute consensus. Nothing in the Ross Sea or Antarctica is going to be done without Russia's agreement. So the, the law is very clear, the proposal is very clear, and I think that Russia has nothing to fear. And I think that Russia can only benefit uh, because that place will provide this unique uh, baseline, this unique reference to be able to study how climate change is affecting an area that is not exploited by other human activities. Now, despite these tensions, uh, Russia and four other Arctic nations, including the United States, managed to sign an agreement last July to protect uh, the um, Arctic waters from uh, unregulated fishing. And I know that they are now trying to bring the international community on board and make that agreement binding. Why do you think this level uh, of uh, successful cooperation was possible in the Arctic, but not in the Antarctic? There is a lot of uh, good international cooperation between Russia and other countries in, in the Antarctic. You know, the Antarctic Treaty is, is a great example. They, they continue collaborating to make sure that there are no military activities, there are no commercial activities, no mining, no uh, other activities on, on the Antarctic continent. And there are other great examples of successful collaboration, like the Arctic Council, where, you know, because the, the governments understand that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic and, and all of the countries are going to suffer if one country does something uh, damaging to the environment. The International Space Station is another great example of collaboration between Russia, Europe and the States. There are many good States. examples, but I, why do you think it's not uh, extended to the same level in the, in the Antarctic? Why do you think it's uh, stopping the progress there? I think that the cooperation is really good in Antarctic in, in research and, and in maintain, maintaining the Antarctic Treaty. The only place where there has been disagreement is this proposal for the Rossi. But I think that now that all the technical issues have been clear and uh, that it is, it is, there is no doubt 
that this would be a reserve for science where Russia and all the other countries would be responsible for managing and forcing it and they would all have the same opportunities for scientific research. I think that uh, now at this point um, the mistrust uh, shouldn't be an issue and now it's uh, just a political decision and Russia uh, taking the leadership. Okay, um, one interesting point that you, you said a, mo a moment ago that the, these countries agreed not to uh, do oil uh, exploration activity in the Arctic and I think that's still uh, um, not given because just uh, a short while ago Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced that uh, Russia is prepared to uh, consider joint oil exploration efforts with other Arctic nations. No, I meant, uh, I meant in Antarctica. Uh, well, then let's let's speak about the Arctic. Do, do you think that uh, that cooperation that you praised before may have negative sides? Because if they if they start cooperating on the let's say oil drill, uh, drilling, I don't think many environmentalists uh, would be happy. Yes, you know, cooperation, international cooperation, in principle, is good, right? If the if the goal is good, cooperation is good. There is a lot of debate about whether oil drilling should be allowed at all in the Arctic. You know, I have been working in the Arctic, in Russia, uh, Greenland, Canada. It's a very harsh environment, very difficult to work in the winter. Uh, we had problems, the world had problems, the United States had problems cleaning the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in a place with warm water with all the resources available. A spill in the Arctic would probably have catastrophic consequences. So th there is something very clear about the danger now. Um, it is still unclear how much and when oil drilling is going to happen, especially with the current uh, oil prices. But you know, the uh, Arctic is so huge, especially the Russian Arctic. So there is room for um, for lots of different things. And many people say, well, you cannot protect parts of the Arctic because you know, there's going to be oil drilling. But, you know, right now, we don't have that 10% of the Arctic protected that Russia and the other countries agreed to. So there is a lot of room still to, to improve conservation and get a balance. Absolutely, and I think one uh, example of how you can uh, do it creatively is, uh, again, the, the example of Gabon that we, we mentioned earlier, because you not only uh, managed to persuade the, the government there to create that marine protection zone, uh, zone, but you also managed to do that without dismantling uh, offshore oil platforms. And I heard you say in one of your public talks that, in fact, that oil shore platforms are benefiting marine, lives because, uh, marine life because they are creating these artificial uh, structures that could serve as, a, as, a, as an artificial reef. Could similar arguments be used to appease the environmentalists in the, in the Arctic? Gabon is a very interesting example because it's, it's a, a flat uh, country, has a flat coast. There are very few rocks. It's mostly mud and sand. And these oil platforms offshore are artificial reefs. We went there thinking that we were going to, we were going to find this industrial Mad Max-like world, right? So we would jump in the water, and immediately we were surrounded by barracuda, tuna, sharks. These places are like oases in the middle of a muddy desert, right? If there are no oil spills, these platforms have a very important role as uh, artificial reefs to increase the biomass of fish, which in turn will help to replenish the local fisheries. Right? Uh, in the Arctic, we don't have the abundances of fish that uh, we have in tropical seas. You know, the, the, the Arctic, the high Arctic, uh, is not known for its fisheries. The Barents Sea is a good place for cod, but you know, we were in France Joseph Land uh, two years ago, and we, we saw very, very few fish. So, um, platforms are out there, I don't know, I don't think they would have the same role as, uh, as they have in a tropical sea where uh, the, they were the only artificial reefs available. Well, anyway, it's, uh, I think, a very inspiring uh, example of how you can think creatively about all those issues, economy, protection, uh, environment. Mr. Salah, I have to thank you very much for being on the show. We are out of time, but our viewers, please share your comments on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook pages, and I hope to see you again, same place, same time, here on Worlds Apart. Thank <laughs> you.